All right, so we're going to do quick introductions. I'm Jamila. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. And uh, I'm Ann. Uh, he, uh, she, her. Anything else? That's great. No, okay. And we'll be facilitating uh, this meeting. Uh, we are going to start with a few speakers who are going to give us a little history of what's gone on so far and what the issues are and then open up for discussion. All right, who's our first speaker, Jay? Leslie, come on up. You want to sit? Yeah. <laughs> Leslie Kagan. Hi, everyone. Hi, Leslie. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Don't applaud. Just send money. <laughs> um, I just want to say a very few quick opening uh, comments here. Um, we, uh, I've been part of the group that's been trying to figure out what to do <laughs> about these new restrictions and the limitations and, the, and some of the historic problems from Heritage of Pride, uh, particularly focused on the questions of the over-presence of, co of the corporate world uh, and the commercialization of pride, uh, as well as what we see as the over-presence and over-policing by the NYPD, uh, that both of these are uh, key issues that then uh, kind of come more to the fore in the particular activities or actions that, that uh, Heritage of Pride uh, has initiated, and you hear more about in a minute. So as we were planning tonight, we thought it'd be good to put some of tonight's discussion in a little bit of context. Uh, and I was asked, because I have a lot of gray hair, <laughs> to say a few words about some of the early days, and I know there are people in the room here who could uh, as well be saying the, this, uh, some of the early days of Pride, uh, when it used to be a march and not a parade. Right. <laughs> so, um, I actually, I actually wasn't living in New York. I was living in Boston for those uh, those early years, but would come down to New York City for those first few years of the the Pride of the March, um, the, you know, the marches that were held. Uh, and I don't have, I didn't have time to go do some little uh, research on this. I don't have the exact dates of everything. But obviously the first march was on the one year anniversary after Stonewall. Um, so uh, that would be some uh, 48 years ago. Um, and it was, and for a few years, those marches began in the village and walked uptown to say, uh, as a way of saying and communicating to the world that we as a community uh, no longer wanted to be ghettoized. That it's one thing to uh, willingly be part of a community and it's another thing to be in a ghetto. <laughs> and we were saying no more that we are literally everywhere and we are taking the fullness of who we are as individuals and as a community out into, into the world, into the world we live in. Um, and it was at some point that changed. Uh, again, I don't remember the exact years. At some point changed and the marches uh, and then became parades started going downtown to end in the village. Um, I don't know if there was, if anybody has documentation on this, but the common sense of everything was that what, what people understood was that part of that shift had to do with businesses, often gay and lesbian owned businesses in the village, wanted everybody to come into the village because after the march, they would go to bars and restaurants and buy things and spend a lot of money. So already we could see some of the kind of corporate and commercial interests uh, influencing what was happening. Those days were again in a context of a lot of social change activism, anti-war activism, the women's movement uh, was, was strong at that point, um, struggles against racism, uh, and, and, uh, and, and poverty, and you know, there was a lot of emotion. And the, so the growing, what we used to call gay movement, now it's obviously much more complicated than that, um, was in that context. And those annual events were a place for us to declare that 
our struggle for liberation, and those were words we actually used and believed in, the struggle for liberation was, uh, was key and important, not only to ourselves, but in the context of this larger movement, we were making a contribution to a big agenda of social change. Uh, for many of us who used to go to those events, what we've seen happen over the years um, and all of a sudden, it, it, it seemed to be the norm uh, at now it's become a parade, was these massive floats and the presence of corporations. And that it wasn't so much, you know, uh, floats are fine. <laughs> you know, it was the message that somehow these corporations were about our struggle for liberation. <laughs> That, uh, that a lot of us started to object to. So I just wanted to set that context that it used to be a very different phenomenon. And, and one reason why we want to call attention to that history, again, I'm giving a very abbreviated history here, is that next year will mark the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. Uh, plans are already underway for a world pride to come to New York next year. And I think many of us, I know many of us are hoping that the work we're doing now uh, to raise our demands uh, to change what happens every June in New York City and the process of organizing the, the hop, uh, marches, parades, that, that our struggle, our work now, we hope is laying a foundation for what we see as a campaign over the next year to change how these annual June parades might become marches again, uh, and how we deal with the over-commercialization and the over-policing, the, the uh, wildly uh, oppressive uh, presence of the police department to try and get a handle on some of that now before we hit the 50th anniversary. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Jay. I use he, him pronouns. Um, so I'm here, uh, actually Leslie gave a, a great segue into what I'm uh, here to talk about, and that's just to give a little tiny bit of an overview about the relations between the NYPD and the LGBTQ communities over the course of the last, um, the last 49 years since Stonewall. Um, uh, you know, there have been uh, there have been fits and starts. There have been some moments that some people consider to be uh, triumphs. Uh, the formation of Goal is one such moment that some people feel that that was a great triumph. That that Goal was able to be formed, and that uh, LGBT officers, or at least lesbian and gay officers at the time, were able to serve openly within the NYPD. Um, uh, some folks, you know, think that that was like a great step forward. Other folks think that Goal's presence on the NYPD has done absolutely nothing to um, to improve the treatment by the NYPD by and large of our communities, particularly our communities of color, over the course of the last 50 years. Um, uh, and you know, there have been moments when uh, there have been moments when Goal has sort of been set forth as a as a symbol of this progress. Uh, 1982 uh, at the um, at the uh, the uh, rally in Central Park, um, uh, coinc coinciding with uh, with the Pride March, uh, an officer named Charles H. Cochran Jr., uh, who was a member of Goal, gave a, a speech in which he stated that today's New York City's police department is not comprised of narrow-minded homophobes. There is no systemic plan for the oppression of gays by the department. Three months later, uh, a gay bar called Blues was um, was raided and people were arrested and uh, there were charges of police brutality there, and you know and the fight continues. Um, you know we have seen you know I, I you know obviously Stonewall was we all know how Stonewall started okay we all know that that was um, you know that was due to a due to police actions of, of, of persecution against members of our community in a bar. Um, largely, in many cases, a lot of these moments of persecution have economic aspects to them as well. Uh, you know, there was a, you know, if you look at the history of Stonewall, there's a lot of talk about tallying the amount of alcohol that was there present in the bar. And uh, obviously, the, the uh, sixth precinct, 
one of our favorite precincts. The sixth precinct was being paid off to the tune of a few thousand dollars, I don't remember if it was a week or a month, um, by the bar in order to stay open. Of course, the bar was owned by the mob. Um, 1982, the situation with Blues Bar was about gentrification, the gentrification of Midtown, the shift from Hell's Kitchen into Clinton and to Midtown. Uh, and the New York Times, New York Times uh, was the one. The New York Times did cover it with one small article, um, which you know there was there were protests that went on for months after the Blues Bar after the Blues Bar was was raided, and uh, you know the Blues Bar was basically across the street from the New York Times, and uh, I'm certain that a fair a fair number of of uh, and it was a yeah it was a people of color bar absolutely and that's the issue with gentrification is that um, that it becomes about the undesirables and in fact the word undesirables was used in the news reporting by the NYPD officer who spoke to the press and describing the people at the uh, at the blues bar uh, undesirable uh, transvestites probably using narcotics things like that that's the kind of that's the kind of way that our community gets demonized and particularly the most marginalized members of our wider lgbtq community which then was you know not perhaps not thought of as one large cohesive group of communities that that function together um, just to, to bring it forward though you know we're, we're not just talking about the we're not just talking about the um, you know the dark ages of uh, the 1960s or the 1980s um, you know even uh, you know over the past course of the last you know five or six years there have been continued uh, instances of of NYPD officers uh, essentially attacking uh, LGBTQ people, uh, particularly in communities of color, particularly transgender people. Uh, walking while transgender has become a thing where transgender women are automatically by virtue of their, by virtue of their clothing are assumed to be sex workers, assumed to be prostitutes, even though they may very well simply be walking home from the subway. Um, we see that we see uh, issues of violence against uh, queer people occurring in more ethnic communities uh, in in the outer boroughs. We see violence against uh, gay people happening uh, by at the hands of the NYPD happening on Staten Island. Um, you know these situations they keep cropping up. Last December, a group of queer activists was walking back from their holiday party. Uh, they were actually set upon by. Um, a group of Trump supporters. So this was not the NYPD necessarily attacking them. Um, but uh, when the NYP uh, finally did arrive on the scene, they basically did nothing. These Trump supporters that had attacked these activists, I don't believe, were arrested. And at least one of the activists after the attack looked down the street and saw one of the attackers leaning into the door of a police car having a conversation with the officer in the car. Um, of course, these guys were also shouting out pro-police slogans. Um, so we, we, we have this, you know, in our demands, um, folks will see, uh, you know, some issues uh, around the mar goal marching and participating in the, um, in the march. Um, you know, we came to a we came to a compromise. There were some folks on our coalition that were like, we don't want goal in the march at all. Um, there were others who, you know, said that they would walk away from the coalition if 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 there was any such talk of barring um, barring members of the the wider LGBTQ community by virtue of their profession. So uh, the compromise that we landed upon was that Goal can march as a unit of people marching all together as Goal, but simply not in uniform. They have t-shirts that say Goal. They could march behind a banner that says Goal. We have no issue with that. We simply ask they not march in uniform because for some members of our wider LGBT community, that connotes, um, that connotes um, a dangerous situation to them, police in uniform. Um, the other issue that we're talking about is, of course, the over-policing of Pride, that's comprised of not only, um, not only just the vast numbers of officers that are deployed on Pride, all getting paid overtime, by the way, to, a, to, to rack up a huge amount of money. Um, the number of police vehicles in the Pride 
parade march. I mean, if there's vehicles, it's not really a march. Um, and the barricading of the march. Um, folks who've been in New York City for, for three, four, or five decades um, and have been participating in Pride for, for a long time know that you know a, a long time ago, three decades ago, you could, if you saw a group of people that you seemed, and you were sitting on the sidelines watching, watching the march or watching the parade go by, and you saw a group of people that seemed to speak to you, you could just hop right on into the parade and join it and continue on your way down, down, to, down to Christopher Street. Uh, that's no longer possible. That's no longer possible because there are interlocking metal barricades everywhere you go in the city. Those barricades are maintained by the police. Crossing those barricades is a, is a crime. You can be arrested for crossing those barricades. Um, that becomes a huge issue. Um, and then there's the issue of, aside from just marching in the march, there's just the issue of the barricading throughout the West Village after the march is over, where you literally cannot go from one side of the street to the other, even after the parade, after the march is done. Uh, you, sometimes you can't even turn a corner because of the massive amount of interlocking barricades. Um, and um, that has become a larger and larger issue. That was, you know, when they were using sawhorse barricades just to create the, 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 um, the appearance of an orderly situation so that to, to give some sort of order to people's movements, that was one thing. Once you made them interlocking metal barricades, once it became an arrestable offense to cross them, that moved into an area of criminalizing uh, criminalizing our communities and of course the members of our communities of color bore the largest brunt of that policing uh, especially in the evening time after you know after the parade um, so those are the sorts of issues that the members of the reclaim reclaim pride coalition was thinking about as we came up with the list of demands that we issued to um, to heritage of pride to the police, to the NYPD, and to the mayor's office. So that's kind of all for me. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'm actually pulling double duty because we asked someone to speak in terms of their experiences last year as one of the 12 queer youth of color who were arrested while blocking the parade last year, and she just requested me to read a statement instead of coming up herself. Um, Introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. I am Jake, and my pronouns are he, him. Are we saying anything else? Is that good? Okay. <laughs> um, so what she said, she wanted to point out that uh, many people are, as Jay has explained, have been upset with the NYPD to begin with. Last year, at the Toronto Pride, uh, Black Lives Matter activists successfully were able to uh, remove all police presence from marching within the parade, and afterwards, the Toronto PD was invited to march in our pride, uh, which was a huge slap in the face to Black, Live Matter, Black Lives Matter activists everywhere. And additionally, as New Yorkers, we did not want more police in our parade. Um, and so a decision was made that may have been made anyways uh, to uh, block the parade. And a significant organizer of that is sitting in the room. <laughs> and, um, yeah. I invited you to come to the parade. I know that there was a lot of conflict with your sisters because we didn't agree. We were approaching it in a radical sense, and I'm here to apologize for anybody that I've stepped toes in, particularly rice and resist. But we wanted to make it clear that when I was called on into job for Justice No Pride in DC, when I went there for months and months of meeting, as a person of color happened to be trans, and I want to extend it, right? I don't, I don't have an option as a person of color, as a trans person of color to separate race and gender. Mm -hmm. I am the odds of all odds and anybody like me is the odds of all odds. When we shut down the parade in DC, it was not an option, it was a necessary tool for us to survive, right? It was a mean of taking a pause and having a conversation own the same type of conversation that Sylvia Rivera <coughs> tried to activate when she was told that she couldn't speak in that stage. It was the same type of treatment when DC and us stopped that parade, right? So I just wanted to reiterate, right? I, like I said, I apologize if last year when I came to Rice and Resist and said, we will block, I know that a lot of you have seen me, and I'm, I'm unapologetically brown and I'm unapologetically trans. <laughs> but I wanted to make it very clear 
The reason being why we were there today is because th that day we were asked by Toronto Black Lives Matter in solidarity mm -hmm. to stop the Toronto police to march because they were asked one thing. As a contingent in the three year process of them having conversation about working with the community because one of the arguments that they brought was being gay is an identity being trans is an identity, being a cop is an occupation. You can go home and change your occupation, but you're still, I'm sorry to say it, a fag, a tranny, a dyke, all of those things. We are all of those things, and we cannot take those shit off. So between Sylvia, from, between from Marta P. Johnson, from the last trans black woman that killed, who was asking help from the police, Issa Nettle had no justice whatsoever. From that time period, we had Kamani Gray, we had the recent one, Asa, uh, um, um, Stephon, Clark. Stephon Clark, we have Chantel Davis, we have lists of lists of lists of lists of black, brown, trans yeah. people that have been killed by the police. Martha P. Johnson hasn't got her justice to this day when every single person that marched that day seek for justice for that woman. So when we ask everybody to understand that these grievances, when it was created, I was part of those people that created those grievances, including trans youth that were planned. It took about two hours to sit there and vision this thing. So I also want to reiterate, for every cis white man that's sitting here that was saying something really negative about that grievance, you have a choice. Either you revolutionize the way we organize pride, or we constantly alienate all the people of color and other genders that are part of this community. And that is something that you have to sleep at night knowing whether you were part of it or you remain silent in your opposition to it. So that's pretty much the option. Uh, so Michael covered most of the points. Uh, one thing that I'll just add that's on here is, um, so th this activist acknowledged that at times communication may have been uh, lacking as far as what was happening. People on the sidelines didn't understand that they were protesting the police specifically and thought that they were, <coughs> sorry, and thought that they were just protesting pride in general. <coughs> sorry, I have asthma. Um, well, thank you. Um, but what they felt is that they were forced to go to such extreme measures because they weren't being listened to by the community and they needed to make a very visual show of their presence lest uh, the police essentially steamroll them. And so they didn't. They sat down and they accepted that arrest because they needed everyone to know how important this was to them. Um, and so that's actually going to roll right into what I was supposed to speak about, <laughs> which is the history of the resistance contingent and what we have been working on this year so far. So last year after the election, I think we all recognized that there was a very um, significant political time upon us, and we needed to make that presence known within our pride parade so that the entire, because this is the most visible parade in the world, we wanted the entire country to know that queer, pe queer people were out there, we cared about them, and that we knew that these political issues were important and we were working to solve them. Um, and after many heated negotiations with HOP, eventually we were granted a contingent of basically allowing several groups who would have been in the march anyways to march together and to march near the front of the parade so that they would make an impact. If you saw any press coverage of the parade last year, if you were there, everything had that picture that we used on our Facebook event of the We Resist banner and people ju just a bunch of angry queers screaming at the top of their lungs to get him out of the White House. Um, but that was hard fought. Additionally, there were many things that Hop told us we would get that we didn't. We were told we would be at the front of the parade and we were literally standing in formation as Senator Schumer's car drove through us <laughs> to get in front of us, which was not exactly what we were told and was also potentially dangerous. Um, so coming into this year, in January, we realized that the registration for Pride was coming up and several of our groups registered. We got in contact with HOP and said, we are interested in doing this again. Um, and HOP requested that we organize and give them a list of groups who were interested in participating that was, and in January. 
In March, just prior to their general body meeting, we received a response from HOP that the resistance contingent would not be marching and that the only organized contingent within the parade this year would be a people of color contingent, which we were told is organized by the Audre Lorde Project. And since co communications with them, it seems like they're, they're not exactly the point people, but um, that was how it was uh, portrayed to us. Uh, their general body meeting was that night, so many of the activists who were involved in planning that, the resistance contingent decided to go. And we brought up a lot of the same issues that we're talking here to uh, the HOP board and the HOP general body, uh, issues of over-policing. We were also uh, revealed a couple of other changes that were being made to the parade this year and the week immediately prior to that, including wristbands for all people that are marching, a limit of 200 people for every group, and the uh, pretty drastic route, route change to the parade. And when that information began to kind of uh, trickle down to everyone else within our communities, uh, it was not well received, to say the least. It's probably why you're here. Um, so after March, the people, that March meeting, the people who were involved in uh, organizing the resistance contingent decided to meet outside to figure out what we would do, because we were still interested in marching together. That, and that was just the case. We're friends, we're allies, and we know that in a parade this large, if you're not big or near the front, you have very little impact. And we felt that our message was important enough that we should get it out there. Um, and over the course of those meetings, we realized that our demands and the demands that we were hearing from our community were really much larger. They did include the police, they did include the issue of restricting who is actually allowed to participate in Pride by giving them wristbands or, um, or having these metal barricades that criminalize you entering the march. Um, and so that's what brought us here. We also pretty much immediately tried reaching out to the people of color contingent. I'm hoping that some of them ended up showing up. <laughs> but <coughs> as well as reaching out to the people who protested within the march last year. <coughs> I'm sorry again. But the point of this is that we have continually had to act outside of this system because Consistently for years, we have felt like we have not, we're not being heard by the people who are organizing this parade unless we force their hand. To get that contingent last year, we basically said, you're either going to give it to us or we're going to take it. And that's essentially what we're doing now because we're, we're consistently not being heard by the people who have the power, and so we need to take the power for ourselves. I'm the final speaker, everyone, and then we're going to open this up to hear everyone else speak. But let me introduce myself. I'm Mr. Natalie. Mike, please. Mike, Mike. Mike. Oh, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to stand. I'm going to be re reading these demands, so I'm, I want to be standing. Um, so, <laughs> so um, these are demands that came out of several meetings that have occurred. I'm sorry. My name is Natalie James. I go by she/her pronouns, and I am primarily part of the Democratic Socialists of America Queer Caucus. And uh, so thank you all for coming, first of all. Um, and basically, these, these demands that I'm about to read were the result of several meetings that occurred mainly in, in April. Um, and they occurred after uh, we were sort of, our hand was sort of forced because um, we didn't feel felt, uh, heard by Heritage of Pride. Heritage of Pride uh, canceled an early meeting in, in, in April, for instance. There was going to be another meeting in, in late, late April that was also canceled. Uh, so we sort of took matters into our own hands, and um, I went with a delegation uh, that included a very amazing um, drag queen by the name of Gladiola Gladrags, um, and, um, and I also went with uh, Jay Walker over here, who had an amazing, he was an amazing unicorn, actually, uh, Jay Walker had a unicorn uh, head on as, as these demands were read, uh, and there were several other people that were with us, but these demands were read directly to the executive director of Heritage of Pride. And um, I, so I'm going to read them to you now, and I should also note that Leslie Kagan uh, edited these demands, so I'm very grateful to her too. Um, uh, so first, some preamble, and I'm going to warn you that this is formal language. I am a lawyer, and I've, I figured HOP is a very formal organization, so I'm going to speak their language a little bit. Um, yeah, so, um, whereas the New York City Pride March emerged out of an LGBTQ community tradition of mutual support and resistance against state, police, and societal oppression epitomized and symbolized by the 1969 Stonewall Riots, and 
whereas the ascent of the Trump administration underscores the ongoing oppression of members of our community, particularly the most vulnerable members, including people of color, those who are transgender or gender non-conforming, disabled people, and immigrants, and whereas the members of this coalition condemn all instances of, of police excessive force, the over-policing of our community, and police militarization, the Reclaim Pride Coalition, currently composed primarily of groups and individuals who marched together in the 2017 New York City Pride March as members of the resistance contingent, makes the following demands upon heritage of pride as to the 2018 New York City Pride March and future New York City Pride Marches. And then there's five categories of demands and a conclusion. So I'll go through with the five categories. First, police presence in the march. This coalition demands that HOP join in our demand for a public apology from the NYPD for the part it played at Stonewall and for historic and ongoing violence by the NYPD against members of, our, of the LGBT community, especially the most vulnerable members of our community. B, there are to be no uniformed or visibly armed off police officers or their vehicles within the march, nor shall any police be afforded a place of pride near the front of the march, nor shall there be a police band. <laughs> this prohibition extends to ICE and corrections officers and vehicles. Number two, police engagement at March. This coalition demands police free zones at Christopher Street, the Pier, and the New York City AIDS Memorial. Security will be provided by trained members of our community, and this coalition will provide a detailed plan for the training and implementation of our community security group. And as an aside, let me say that Jamie Bauer has been attending our meetings, and uh, Jamie Bauer is an absolutely fabulous uh, secu community security uh, planner. HOP must insist to the NYPD that there will be no police barricades along the march route and in the assembly areas for the march. HOP must call on the NYPD to not arrest people engaged in direct action protests, including but not limited to die-ins or brief sit-ins within the march. Yeah. HOP should not serve as a de facto extension of the NYPD. Yeah. There shall be no cooperation between HOP nor the NYPD with ICE during New York City Pride. Third, community group participation versus commercial and political contingent group participation. This coalition demands that no limits be placed as to the numbers of participants in the march in community, activist, and not-for-profit group contingents. More specifically, we reject the limit of 200 people in these contingents. This coalition demands that no wristbands be required of participants in these contingents. This, this coalition demands that the March contingents of corporate and for-profit entities be limited to 200 participants. This same restriction should be applied to community groups that join with or are sponsored by corporate or for-profit entities, i.e. hybrid contingents with explicit corporate branding. Um, contingents present, representing or including political parties, elected officials, and political candidates shall also be limited to 200 participants and should not march in a place of pride near the front of the Pride March. The resistance contingent. The members of this coalition demand to march in the 2018 New York City Pride March as a unified group as we did in the 2017 Pride March. The group will again be called the resistance contingent in recognition of the ongoing and unique oppression enacted upon our community by the Trump administration. Uh, five, Pride March route. This coalition demands an honest and transparent explanation for the dramatic route change enacted by Heritage of Pride to the 2018 Pride March route. This coalition also demands a representation in the logistical planning of the march moving forward. This coalition demands that issues of accessibility for the disabled members of our community during the march be satisfactorily accommodated, including but not limited to issues as such as how people with disabilities will travel to the Pride Festival after the march. 
In closing, in addition to the above demands to HOP, the Reclaim Pride Coalition believes that HOP's management of the annual New York City Pride March, resulting in commercial and police saturation of the march, among other unacceptable characteristics, has led to decades-long conflict with and the alienation of many individuals and groups within the New York City LGBTQ community. The Reclaim Pride Commission Coalition calls on HOP to relinquish control of the management of the Pride March following the 2018 Pride March and engage in a process of opening up the organizing and control of this important event to the community the Pride March grew out of and should continue to represent. All right, everyone. So now we are done with all of the speakers. So folks that have comments or questions, if you can transition over here to the side, unless, yeah. And I'm gonna give myself a quick 90 seconds because I feel like this wasn't touched on when we talk about corporatism. Um, so let me just time myself real quick. <laughs> So in terms of corporatism, I think it's great that it was mentioned, but I also just want to reiterate some issues around the corporatism, right? It's also issues around the fact that within these corporate entities, they engaged in um, you know, investing in the Dakota Access Pipeline, also investing in prisons, also investing in immigration and customs enforcement. So it's a broader issue than just you know us having an issue with corporatism or what we should. It's like it's actually coming after people of color in these different ways in indigenous communities. So I just wanted to kind of put that there real quick because I feel like that really wasn't touched on and it's something that's a broader issue that we're not really thinking about in the context that we should. And I hope that HOP really thinks about the fact that that's an issue, especially since migrant communities, a lot, for example, the folks that I work with, this is gonna be their first pride and to know that they're investing in the detention centers that they were locked up in is horrifying, right? So, um, just so you know, um, the way this is gonna go is I have it at 90 seconds and then it's just gonna beep. So, um, if you have like a couple more seconds, that's totally cool to speak, but please don't go over because it's awkward for me to say, please don't talk anymore, <laughs> okay? Um, I, don't, I don't wanna be that person. Um, okay, so. All right, so we have the microphone over there. And first person, if you want to say your name and gender pronouns so people can respond to you directly. And, and I'll walk this microphone around the room, this too. Is this on? Okay. Yeah, it is. Well, first of all, as far as the 90 seconds is concerned, my name is Janae Imperato. I'm a member of Workers World, People's yeah. Power Assembly. And I would just like to say this, which is not part of my remarks. Uh, I do appreciate uh, Leslie's remarks down Nostalgia Lane. I certainly could picture all those establishments. I did want to say this to able-bodied people, okay, about the word parade. And I am just suggest kindly that you should consider very carefully how you define the word parade in terms of is that meaning that this is a modification of, of the parade? And the reason I say that is disabled members of our community can not march. Yeah. So that's why many people in the disabled community of the LGBTQ community welcome the word parade. We don't see it as embracing these corporate motherfuckers. We ain't got shit to do with that. We got to do with the fact that most of us roll. We do not march. So please consider that because I've had to confront this a number of times. And then, frankly, before I was disabled, I used to put it down. But guess what? Sometimes you have to look at things from a different uh, uh, perspective. I would also like to say, does anybody here remember 1993? when we had a counter-march, yes. if I remember, because I know yeah. it was on Charles Street. Um, and uh, I just wanted to throw that out, because some people may have a, actually a clearer memory, <laughs> you know, as you get over 60. <laughs> certain aspects become um, a little murky. Um, I just wanted to say about this route. I think that this route is an attack on this community. Okay? And can I just say this? Uh, I was born and raised, my family is both from the West Village and from Hell's Kitchen, where we would like to put the hell back in the kitchen. Thank you. So let me just, if I could just say this, 
these racist elements in the community, many of whom, guess what? Heritage of Fry, the apartment building on the corner of Bedford and Christopher, that would throw hot water on me and my siblings of color. This is the elements in our community we should have nothing to do with. And they should be attacked and separated from the progressiveness of our community. And also this, I want to say this. This march, which many people looked forward to when, as soon as you turned on 8th Street and went down 5th Avenue into 8th Street, the preponderance of people of color from 5th Avenue and 8th Street all the way to Washington Street, now that's all been, what, eliminated? And then what is this bullshit about? University Place. <laughs> University Place, give me a break. This is nothing but an attack. And I don't want, listen, I drove a taxi in New York City for 30 years. I, nobody can tell me about this congestion pricing. So in closing, I just want to say that our community needs to assertively confront these forces because we are the ones who have struggled the most and some of them who have struggled the least have benefited from us. Thank you very much. You know, it's very disempowering, and you do this to me all the time to tell me to keep it brief. My name is Jim Forat. I'm 76 years old. I participated in the Stonewall Rebellion. I participated in the organizing and marched in the first march and many other marches since then. I want to thank the coalition for coming together to talk particularly about the police. It's not just our march. It's happening all over the place. De Blasio and his police chiefs have come up with a plan that encases us, divides us, and I've seen it over and over again, most recently in, in Columbus Circle. So it's a huge problem and we need to unite with other groups about the police to talk about this. A little tiny bit of history, because I only have 90 seconds for an old man, that is difficult, but I'll try to do it. The mafia took back the parade in the middle 70s. That is why it came back downtown. Because they had all their homophobic food carts out. If anyone remembers, you know, they were there. But the role of elected officials, you know, this community has really changed over the years. We have gained so much because of what people like myself and my generation did and sacrificed so that younger people could have careers and be elected and do things like that. But the role of the elected officials have gone along with all of these changes. And Christine Quinn, more than anyone else, is responsible for those barricades, for putting us inside of barricades down on West Street, for kicking out the, the intergenerational, mostly families of color that used to picnic as a part of their cultural tradition on Hudson Park. To the Heritage of Pride people, you know, some of the people that work there are really, they're young, they're good people, they want to do something. They don't understand who the board of directors are. They don't understand who the corporate powers are that are there. But I would hope very much that the elected officials, the openly gay and lesbian ones who have been here tonight, would stand up and stand with us to take back this march, and it will always be a march to me. The first one was called Christopher Street Liberation March. We went from downtown, as Leslie said, up to the Sheep Meadow. And rallied. And rallied, yes. And we used to have a silent stop in front of St. Patrick's Church because they, that institution more than any other institution for women and for gay and lesbian, people of all gender expression has been oppressive and, and killed us over centuries. She, Christine Quinn, when she wanted to be mayor, moved the start of the line so we didn't go past St. Patrick's, so that those good Irish people in Queens would not think that she was against the church. There's so much history that needs to be said, and I'm not, my time is up, I'm not gonna, it can't be said here, but this is an intergenerational fight. I'm with the Gay Liberation Front. We chose last year 
to support the resistance contingent, but we marched separately. And some of you came and joined us because they had us all the way in the back, and we had a samba band full of trans people. We wanted you all, young people, to know that this movement was started the third night of Stonewall Rebellion, and it was a multi-issue politic. We knew that we couldn't be free if everyone else wasn't free too. And even the diversity of our community, we had to recognize that. Assimilation is one of the problems here. The right to, and you know, I'm not attacking people who want to be assimilated, but the right to be different has to be one of the mantras that comes out of this meeting, the right to be different. All right. So uh, a couple of things. There is, um, I think, a hat going around that's for rent for this space. So I've been asked to just let you know that, oh, it's a bag. OK, so it's, there's a bag going around. So it's like we're, there's an ask for 4 to $5 to be able to pay for the space. And also, the last couple of people spoke about four minutes. So the goal is 90. Well, we can, we, how about we go for? Two minutes. I'm fine with two minutes, but after, it's not my decision, y'all. I didn't just, you know, there, there's like a whole group of people that have four minutes. That's, we want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to speak. That's really what the issue is, right? We want everyone to have an opportunity to speak, so that's why we're keeping it to two minutes, okay? Um, and there's a line, and I'm sure some people will come up over here too. So um, I'm starting you. Name, gender pronouns so people can respond to you, and please, two minutes. Thank Will, you. Will DM, um, I was just wondering if it had been brought up the negative environmental uh, issue with the wristbands. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if that was like another way to fight um, against them. I um, um, is that, yeah, direct yeah, answer real quick? I, for the last a year, and a, a year since the last arrest, the 12 people that got arrested, the original grievances that we sent was a carbon copy of what DC had which is from No Justice, No Pride, which by the way, no response. One of the, uh, one of the, the, one of the issues that was brought up was about environmental issues. Mm -hmm. Because of a, lot, what, a lot of it was centered also on indigenous to scary community that made a lot of big deal about environmental issues. But because we didn't get the response, we have no, no answer. Yeah, so I mean, that's the response. There's and by the way, this is a series of four emails that I sent myself to them, which caused me to go to their meeting and go I mean, completely out of, I think this is a more specific question. Yeah, I think you're asking specifically about the risk ends, right? Yeah, those, I mean, there, there's the overall negative environmental aspect of the corporate handouts, like yep. the plastic wristbands that are already being thrown out, but adding everyone in the parade having a wristband seems like it'd be... Thank you very much. And, um, and there are also those uh, occurring, so, okay. yeah. All right. Okay. Thank my you. name is Mary Ellen, and my pronouns are she, her. Our friend Hal Moskowitz could not attend this evening, so he sent along his comments and asked me to share them. Uh, I agree with everything he wrote. Uh, I want to make sure that a committee for intermediary group, at the very least, is formed of, from among the community attendees at the town hall this evening. This proposed advisory council or committee would examine and oversee planning World Pride New York City 2019. And perhaps reorganization or replacement of the HOP, the Hot Board of Directors. Yeah. Of course, I do not know the details of how this Pride 2018 debacle got planned and sent. I know that there are two sides to every story and I only know mine, which is emotional. But I do feel that the Board of Cops does not have the community's best interests. No one should lose sight of the fact that this has become a circus. Too corporate, especially in this trying time, the Pride March should be grassroots. Leoshenko represented the Trust LGBT. I was lucky enough, I applied for March uh, in October, in November, and I was petrified when I saw that we had to pay, and I was persistent emailing Heritage of Pride, and I met with them in November or December, I already don't remember. My point is that we are grassroots organization. We are immigrants, queer immigrants. We are not represented enough, and for me, New York City Pride is only about 
Let me, let me put it this way, white male privileged uh, community. And, uh, and that's why when I was meeting with them, they told me they're trying to manage the next year global pride, but paying additional 100 dollars for 20 people, a lot of corporations will do that. We cannot pay at a dime because we are absolutely a volunteer organization. And I told them, can I wish that Brighton Beach Pride, which we launched last year, gonna be separate in a few years and we didn't have to march with the New York City Pride. It should be renamed Manhattan Pride because we have Queen's Pride, Harlem Pride, Staten Island Pride. Why you are monopolizing space calling it New York City? It's not New York City Pride. It's Manhattan Pride, which is located in Manhattan. And respects, seriously, I come from that a very uh, outrageous authoritarian regime. For me, it's like a prison. I should wear, what is this, identification? How I should explain? I told them, Russians have a big representation. We have 12 republics over 350 people each year. Deal with Russians. If you want to keep them from entering the pride, good luck. I'm not going to be a guard of that uh, pride because they're going to be spite you. And I'm washing my hands of that. I, I, I hope that uh, corporate world could be somehow re re reduced in that representation, but I know that I'm fighting for its commercialization of pride. I hate capitalism, and that's why I hate it, right? Brighton Beach Pride. Oh yeah, the second Brighton Beach Pride is taking place on May 20th on Brighton Beach Boardwalk. And we are having the huge uh, representation of resistance as well. And we are having uh, a huge crowd that time because homophobia in Brighton Beach and transphobia and xenophobia and racism is in Time and place. Time and place. Uh -huh. So it's place Brighton Beach Boardwalk on the island stuff. You have to go a uh, little bit to the theme park. It's the entrance to the boardwalk. And it's 12 p.m. We are gathering at 12 p.m. We are uh, starting off at 12.30. It's going to be rally down there. So we are having some uh, cool speakers. So please come. And, and is there a Facebook page? We or have something? Facebook page. I'm going to leave some uh, flyers. flyers? Yeah, okay. speakers will be cute. Uh, very cool queue because queue train queer, so welcome to yeah. the <laughs> Alexis and I use she and her pronouns. Um, I have two things. One is a statement from the Lesbian First Story Archives. The coordinators weren't able to be here and they asked me to read on their behalf. The Lesbian First Story Archives is very concerned with the commercialization of the Pride March. The increased police presence, the forced identification by means of wristbands, the limitations in access and egress because of barricades, and very much with the exclusion of resistance groups. On these issues, we agree with the Reclaim Pride Coalition and ask for these decisions to be changed and for the Pride March to reflect real values of pride and resistance. Yeah. And then just really briefly, um, last year I was helping to marshal the resistance contingent, and this is a tiny example of policing, but I'm only giving it to think about how it looks on a broader scale, right? So we were at the back of the resistance contingent where they had the interlocking barricades slightly ajar to let new people in. And very quickly, young volunteers from Heritage of Pride began physically trying to stop people from entering, physically interacting with queers trying to enter the space. And when that stopped working, they actually went over to police people who were standing there and tried to call the police on queers trying to enter the Pride March. That is fucked up, okay? that one little contingent, but we saw that again and again. We rounded the corner, there was a hole in the barricades and some folks tried to enter. Again, physical all, physical interaction with those people to try to stop them and calling over the cops. Five people wearing Heritage of Pride paraphernalia and volunteering for Heritage of Pride. Hello, Jeremiah. Hey. Uh, <laughs> Jeremiah, being him. And I'm just going to pull it. I'm going to think about my kid because I'm tall. Um, <laughs> I'm going to drop my paper. But, uh, you know, I, I, um, 
I'm really proud of this group that's worked so hard to put this together tonight, and that people have come out on a Friday night to talk about all of this, because this is incredibly important. This is the event that represents LGBTQ issues to the world, and it was televised last year because it was so important. And so we need for Heritage of Pride to, in good faith, organize with us and not make everything such a goddamn fucking fight all the time. It drives me crazy because, you know, last year, Christopher Street West in oh. LA made the common sense decision to make it into a resistance march yeah. because that was what we were facing at the moment and that was the voice that we need to put out there. And we had to fight tooth and nail just to get a resistance contingent. Yeah. And then this year, from the top down, we are being uh, ordered to disband all of the planning that we were doing after being invited to do it again this year. Mm -hmm. And it's maddening and, it, and, it's, and it's obnoxious. And the fact of the matter of it is, is that this is an event that sprouted out of the efforts of trans people, of Thank people you. of color, and heritage of pride, whether you're being compensated or just getting privileged or getting to fly around on pride junkets or whatever it is yeah. you do with the two and a half million dollars that every year that you yeah. earn. Yeah. You, earn, you have privilege and you have benefits that you get out of this. And so it is the burden on you to act in good faith and show that you are truly engaging all of our communities, particularly those who are most marginalized. And we absolutely can't continue to ignore the issues of policing this is the issue to show if white people are gonna show up for people of color now. This yeah. is the issue. And we can't continue to not act like it's an issue. So we need to have these complex conversations. And for me, when Heritage of Pride canceled without any sort of uh, you know, warning, two meetings with us, yes. it completely let me know that there is no good faith effort, that this is a top-down autocratic uh, group that doesn't want to work with us. So I'm really proud of us tonight, and I really hope that going forward that we show up to the march anyway with resistance contingent, no matter what. And you can stop us, you can police us, you can drag us away, we'll have the media there, I guarantee it. Um, and, we need, and we need a community mechanism for Pride uh, 50. We need one, because this is not our community mechanism. We need like Like, where's the fucking solidarity at, y'all? Sorry, that was inappropriate. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, please go. Oh, do we Hi, have one over here? Okay. I'm Jennifer Sheher. I just want to say from a disability um, perspective and uh, Americans with Disabilities Act perspective, you're actually... Um, for disabled people not only being socially exclusive, but you're also creating a danger. Um, the police barricades mm -hmm. locked, but yeah. the, the parade is very long. In fact, it's so long that I rented a scooter for myself, which was very hard for me. I did it, but um, I prefer to march by rent the scooter. But the lot barricades are a danger for people with claustrophobia, crowd issues, physical yes. disabilities, mental disabilities, older people who, um, people who get tired being locked in the parade yeah. is not acceptable. Right. Also, <laughs> going uptown makes it a burden on that list of people who are already exhausted from the parade and want to go to the festivities back in the village. We've already gone through a three-mile parade and we want to go party. Um, <laughs> um, and that's putting an additional burden on us. Further, if you're 
stopping in Madison's Square Park, that's not uh, my memory. Uh, ADA compliant subway stop. I think Christopher Street is. So you might want to think about all that. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Andy Hum, I'm a, I'm a he him. And uh, when I came to the city movement in 1975, there was the Christopher Street Liberation Day Committee, Sizzle Day. That's right. Uh, and I was sent, and so long ago, I was the Catholic representative from Dignity. <laughs> an atheist a lot longer. But it was all grassroots groups that sent representatives, and they met every week, I believe, every week during the year to plan this one day. And it's, well, uh, you know, all right, and it was great, and that's the kind of movement that we were, but eventually people didn't want to go to meetings every week uh, just to plan one day because we did a lot of other things, and also the movement, movement became a lot more uh, bureaucratized. So there's that. The question is if we want to keep meeting like that on that basis, it takes a lot of stamina uh, to do this at week in, week out, not just to, you know, have a couple of meetings. So I think we also have to demand that, uh, uh, that hot democratize at least have open meetings at least once a month. And there, and there has to be, whatever we decide, they have to be responsive to. It can't just be, you know, oh, we'll take it under advisement and not do it. Um, now, in the short run, I think we can push our way to the front, even to the front, you know, and if they won't go along with this. Uh, but I think what we can do between now and then is, to, is to, for everybody to take a, identify other groups that say, we are a part of the resistance. We are signing on to this, whether it's Lambda Legal or the ACLU or Dignity or whoever it is, and say, you want to be a resistance group this year? You want to join us with this? Sign up, make it a larger contingent and not just the people in this room and, and our membership. Uh, I think, so that's what can happen this year, I think, and make it and make it better, but I think the longer thing is Stonewall 50, and the things I'm hearing about Stonewall 50 are not encouraging from people who are involved or volunteering, and we've really got to transform that. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Travis Morales. I'm with the group Refuse Fascism and a supporter of the Revolutionary Communist Party. Yeah. And Refuse Fascism, we have a very simple unifying demand. This nightmare must end, the Trump Pence regime must go. In the name of humanity, we refuse to accept the fascist America. I've got two basic points. One, given the history of the NYPD in the city and murdering, whether it's Eric Garner or, or Marley Graham or whoever, the, the the brutality beaded out against LGBTQ people, given what ICE is doing right now, treating people like the Nazis treated the, the Jews, treat, uh, treat immigrants like the Nazis treated the Jews in Germany. To me, having the NYPD or ICE in the Pride March is like having the KKK wanting to be in the MLK March. Thank you. The second point is this. It is shameful, shameful, that Hop a, is trying to suppress break up and silence the resistance contingent. Right now, when resistance is needed more than ever, when you have this trump pinch regime that is every day, whether it's attacking the rule of law, attacking LGBTQ people at the hands of Mike, conversion therapy pence, whether you have, you know, the way they're going after immigrants, preparing for war, we need resistance. And they should be encouraging people to be resisting. We need to be resisting and, and preparing to come out in our thousands, tens of thousands, and millions very soon in the streets, day after day, night after night, to drive out this regime from power before it is too late. We have to do what people in Nazi Germany didn't do when Hitler came to power. And on the Pride March is, is an opportunity to reach out to many more people. That you have to stand up to this and resist it. Thank you. I have to say that 
This is not, last year was not the first time queers have been arrested in the Pride March. I myself was arrested in the Pride March blocking Giuliani with fed up queers way back. You know, I mean, there's, there is a history of the Pride March not always being so friendly to those of us on the more radical end of things. But I also, as director of a homeless LGBT youth organization, have to say that we pulled out of the march several years back. And um, a couple reasons for that. One is that it just became too expensive. I can feed the kids or I can be in a march. What am I gonna choose? Not the march. But the other piece of it is that once we got down into the village and the youth were kind of set free, we were really concerned about their safety with the militant policing of the village that evening. And we still get reports of incidents from youth who are in the village on Pride Eve and having confrontations with officers. So that's, you know, we really need to make the point to hop that if they care at all about our LGBT youth, they need to really be on top of this issue. And finally, I'm also the daughter of a man who took me to my first Pride March in a stroller when he could take his stroller off the sidewalk into the street, you know, in the 70s. But also, when he was in his mid-80s and at Pride with me, you know, when you get to the end of the parade, and you're heavily barricaded, not just the parade itself, but the surrounding area, it's extremely difficult to get him from the end of the parade with limited mobility to the trains. And so the barricading, we need to be very conscious that we have to not just focus on the barricading of the immediate event, but also the surrounding area and the access to the subways. My name is James, he, him. I just want to add and reiterate how what we do here is so important. Uh, we mentioned cities like Toronto and DC, where I believe they uh, blocked the Lockheed Martin. Uh, uh, in uh, and in Columbus, Ohio, where I uh, went to my first Pride March, uh, it was the same situation where the organizers uh, six the police on four people and had them arrested and actually went to court and continued to push so that those charges would be raised and not just, you know, like a disorderly conduct, but escalated. Yeah. So I think it's so important that we escalate against Hop here because, you know, this is a televised march. It's huge and New York City is the center of the world, obviously. <laughs> That it is. Um, yeah, I'm back. Um, I uh, just wanted to like throw out uh, just a, a couple of things. Um, one is that you know people were talking about all the outer borough prides, right? You know, and, and, and those are all relatively new compared to the history of of, of, of heritage of pride pride. And there's a reason why all those outer borough prides make sense, and that is because folks in the outer boroughs didn't feel welcome at this at this Greenwich Village pride. And and it's gotten to the extent that the, whoever, I can't remember who it was that was speaking, you know, said that, you know, this is Manhattan Pride because all the other world, uh, Harlem Pride this year is on the same day. It's on the same day. And do you know why Harlem Pride is on the same day? Well, I think you can guess why Harlem Pride is on the same day. Maybe they think the NYPD will be too busy <laughs> to come uptown because my up there. Okay, so it's you know when we're looking at when we're looking at this thing, Heritage Pride has to look at at our larger LGBTQ communities, and I never say community in the singular. It is because we are made up of communities, we that cross over, that that mix, that match, that sometimes don't don't agree with one another. But we are a wide group of communities that are all in this fight together, that are all fighting for our rights together. And that's really important to remember. And Heritage of Pride needs to remember that it is a sea of different communities that all make up this beautiful LGBTQ world that we're a part of. Um, and um, there's one other thing that I didn't bring up when I, when I spoke about the police and I met too. 
and that is that, um, and I really do wish that someone from the NYPD or Gull had come. I'm really grateful that folks from Heritage of Pride did come and take the time to, to, to hear what folks have to say. If there and, are any members of the New York State <laughs> <laughs> That's right, she said publicly. Please identify <laughs> Um, and that is that, you know, it, it, this is like one of those things that people don't think of. It's like a Venn diagram kind of thing. That's in 2006, the, um, the FBI, this was under the George W. Bush administration. In 2006, the FBI issued a report stating that there had been a sustained effort by organized white supremacist groups to infiltrate law enforcement and civil defense at every level around the country. Yeah, sure. To my mind, to my memory, I cannot recall a single instance of any municipal, statewide, or federal law enforcement group or agency doing anything about that. We have gone through two mayors since that report was issued, I have not heard either one of those two mayors say anything about that report. We've gone through three or four police commissioners here on the NYPD. I have not heard one of those police commissioners say anything about that. And what does this have to do with LGBTQ pride? Well, you know what? White supremacist organizations, they're usually not too crazy about the game. <laughs> okay, when you want to talk about a Venn diagram of overlap between white supremacists and homophobes, you're talking about a 90% overlap, okay? And so, you know, and, and then people have to, you know, there's no wonder why a lot of people uh, in our community, a lot of, uh, a lot of just LGBTQ people, but especially LGBTQ people of color, are concerned about this huge presence of police at Pride. We, you know, we, we're worried, okay? They're scary. They scare a lot of us. They scare the hell out of me. That's it. Thank you. Shelly, she, her. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I, it's very good that the issue of cops out of our parade, our march, is, is coming up in an organized way this year. The origin of the cops is uh, slave catchers. Yeah. That's, yeah. And that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's who the, the cops truth. are. I really want to thank the people who organized this and who pulled together this meeting and you know have, have identified the issues. We've got what six, seven weeks, I think, yeah. till Pride, and it seems obvious that you know going forward we're both going to be pushing these demands uh, and our demands on heritage of Pride and doing all we can to to get them uh, to accede to them and organizing for what we're gonna do when they don't accede to them, right? Mm -hmm. It's obvious. So, the, we really have to be looking toward a massive, massive mobilization and really bringing out our community and really representing our community. It's, that's not this room yet. Mm -hmm. Our community, our communities, our majority people of color, as is the city of New York, and, um, you know, there needs to be tremendous outreach, tremendous working with all the groups, and we've only got six or seven weeks. And I do think that going forward, the statement that was read, or the list of demands, which I thought was pretty damn good, should be the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the coming, uh, that you, you sign on to that when you come on, and, and nothing else. Because we don't all agree on a million things. Yeah. I believe last year the rise and res the resistance group in the front said that you couldn't bring different groups. They invited different groups to join, but they couldn't bring their own signs. No. 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 Well, no. No. Okay. No. No. Good. Okay. Good. Because that's what I was going to say. We want the broadest representation of our communities when we come out and you know uh, create what should be. Um, a resurgence of the spirit of Stonewall, the fighting, anti-cop, anti-racist, united spirit of Stonewall. So let's encourage everybody from all our communities with all our issues to unite around these demands. Six or seven weeks to do it. Thank you. Uh, it would be helpful if people could start to talk about what we are going to do concretely from now on, you know, are we going to 
uh, form a group to try to negotiate more with HOP, to reach out to other organizations, uh, who's going to volunteer to be part of that effort, make phone calls to organizations to get them to sign on. Uh, we need to organize this room to do that. Uh, Natalie, did you want to say something? I would just like to announce that um, a week from tomorrow, here at the center at 1.30 p.m., there will be a meeting where we'll, we'll be discussing strategic planning. Um, so, you know, if people want to voice that now, uh, but also to feel free to... 1.30 p.m. on a Friday? Uh, Saturday. 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 Saturday.
You made excuses. I watch a female, I watch a woman who's been experiencing misogyny in front of your meeting. And then I ask you, how is it possible when your panel is predominantly white cis gay men that I have yet, by the way, I've seen, been active in the community, have not participated in any grassroots organizing, but yet I can decide for the well-being of black and brown and indigenous queer people of color. Because why? None of you guys took an initiative, but you are so quickly to tokenize, and by the way, I've been watching your events page, you've been using a lot of black and brown people as part of your campaign thing, but there is a significant difference between tokenizing black and brown bodies and being part of it. I've been marching for People's Monday for three years. None of you guys ever showed up to fight for the liberation of black queer people that's dealing with police. And you're telling me, and you're telling me as a person, a trans person, when I was there, that you were so quickly to call the security. When I ask you one thing, how is it possible in a predominantly white cis space that you can decide the well-being of a trans woman of color? And guess what you guys did? Call the security, and guess what I said? I will shit all over my body before that security dragged me out of here. Because I have the right to be here like any other sister of color that you guys decided to push out. Because I know those sisters that you guys pushed out in those meetings. I know those sisters that you pushed out out of those board members. Because you don't want to be intersectional. You want to center binary in cisness and whiteness. And that is the sin that you guys are doing. Okay. Um, so we're going to pass the bag around again because we're a little light and we need to pay for this space in order for us to meet here, right? So the bag is going around. We're asking for folks to throw in like 4 to $5 if possible. Um, just keep an eye on the screen bag, okay? And uh, also, a couple folks have gone over. Can we keep it to two minutes just because we're running low on time? Okay, thank you all for being respectful of that. Hey, uh, Alex E. Him. I just wanted to reiterate, Corey Johnson was invited tonight to come. That was one of the things that I have made a point of pointing out. Also, Carlos Menchacha, who is a city council member, who is also a queer man and makes point of that in his communications to his contingency. Um, sorry, contingent, whatever. Constituency. There we go. Um, so that is definitely a thing that I've been focusing on in terms of like forward steps. I know there was argument about whether or not elected officials should be included in the parade. Uh, for Cynthia Nixon's candidacy for governor, she is an openly bisexual woman with a queer partner. <laughs> so my point of just trying to continue to like hammer home, we have these people available. They like play upon their identity as a member of our community. They should absolutely be people that we're leveraging and using as you know a point to come to Heritage of Pride with city officials who are expecting these changes to be uh, made as well. Uh, and I also have heard, you know, uh, Tish, I think her last name is James, the public, uh, the public advocate, has been a wonderful ally. She was here for the gag town hall that happened here less than a month ago, or like a month and a half ago. Um, so really just leaning on these people as well to be absolutely a part of this, um, as well as the fact that, uh, as Michael just pointed out, Pride has been doing promotional campaigns with events at some of the bars around Manhattan, coffees that are happening and things. Um, Adam Eli from Voices 4 was just included in like a photo shoot that happened from that. That's a member of our community that is participating in, in their promo campaign. We should be leaning on our people as well and making sure that everyone is in sync about the idea that these things need to occur and that we should not be contributing to their promotional materials until that happens. Yep. My name is Ken Kidd. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Hey, I just want to speak to one thing, and that is the route, the march route. Uh, and I particularly want to talk about the march route for 2019, because I'm sorry, I don't believe that we're going to get a lot of the things that we are asking for in the next seven weeks. The simple fact of the matter is that meetings have been canceled the day of a meeting. Meetings have been canceled because demands were delivered. The day the demands were delivered, Pop canceled the meeting that was supposed to take place on April 30th with the police. So my good faith going forward for the next seven weeks is diminished. I have to say, Julian, I'm sorry. But I do want to say that we have an opportunity right now for next year's 
World Pride event in 2019, the 50th anniversary, rather than truncating the event down to be a shadow of its former self. I'm an events planner by trade. I know for a fact that you do not, if you're expecting twice as many people to come to an event that you have had, go to a room that is half as big. That's just not what you do if you know what you're doing. I also know that there have been problems in the past with the march lasting nine hours. I get that. But I also know that Heritage of Pride has said that they are keepers of the public trust, that they understand that they are responsible and that they keep alive the heritage of pride, that they are responsible enough to know how to manage an event, that they begged to get world pride over many, many, many other cities because they said that they could do it. I would offer you don't do it by making the march route half as big. You don't do it by squandering the heritage of pride to turn it into a march that has no there there, going nowhere, ending somewhere above Madison Square Park or something. So I would offer, because I don't like to make a complaint without offering a suggestion. I would offer that next year, the march proceeds down its traditional heritage of pride down Fifth Avenue, starting the same place or thereabouts that it did last year, cutting across to our cultural icon of Stonewall, cutting across 8th Street, going across, taking the turn across past Stonewall, then turning back up 7th Avenue, a wider avenue, an avenue where more people can march, where the, where the parade can get wide again, going past the former St. Vincent's, which is also a part of our heritage. Yeah. 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 Going past the Ace Memorial, which is a big part of our heritage of pride. Going up further 7th Avenue into Chelsea, a neighborhood that we made a part of our heritage of pride, and in somewhere where folks can, can, can get off, like on 14th Street or 23rd Street. And I would Let's offer off. that I'm happy to help with that, and I would encourage other people to do that too for next year. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, first, Leslie reminds us, if you haven't signed in at the desk, please do so, so we can all be in touch with each other. And I just want to remind everybody that Stonewall 25, we had two marches, because the city hated us, wanted to marginalize us, and told us we had to march on First Avenue, uptown into Central Park. And while that happened, Many of us were on Fifth Avenue marching uptown to Central Park. So I would just suggest that this year, next year, we can create our own march, our own activist march, going uptown, across town, around town, anywhere we want to go. All right, go ahead. If anyone is interested in joining me with trying to meet with the LGBT Caucus of City Council, which has 13 members, please come and see no, me. It it over. We need to have that kind of leadership. And I absolutely agree with Ken that the root is critical. This is the first time I heard what they've done to us, and I'm outraged. <laughs> but I have a soft spot for going back to the Sheep Meadow, going back to our Bible Stars, and where we were in the very beginning. Uh, it's our park, we're taxpayers, we're citizens, it's a public park. Yeah. Run by the conservatives. I also want to encourage those of us who identify with resistance, and I'm including the Gay Liberation Fund people, that we participate actively in all of the other marches that take place the Queen's March, the Staten Island March. We, some of those, I mean, this, it makes me sad about the Harlem March is the same day, but I understand it. Well, I understand, and I thought Jay really to the point. But participate and talk to people. You know, we cannot just be seen as this opposition group, you know, really radical, wanting this and that. We need to talk to all of those people that come. And I have one condition that I wish I had gone to the meeting and I would have said, let's reverse 
the march. Yes. Let's put all those fabulous groups at the end. If you haven't stayed to see what happens at the end of the march, it's mostly people of color. It's most of them really proud to be LGBT people and having a fabulously good cultural time. And put all the politicians, all the government sponsors, all those people at the back of the march. I'm Simone, she, her, and I find it absolutely ridiculous what Heritage Equad is doing. I think that, above all, I, that you would call police officers on your own community is ridiculous. I don't understand why you even have to say something about that. And, like, Stonewall was writing against the police. That was how this movement was founded, writing against police, that you would call the police on your own community is ridiculous. And the Police presence at Pride is ridiculous. Um, I understand if LGBTQ officers want to march because this is also their community, but they should not be marching in uniform. They should not be armed. Yeah. In the past two years, um, I've gone to Pride with one of my close friends who's black, and every year we get lost when we're trying to find the Pride festivities because it's super confusing and. We have to go find the police officer for us to ask for directions, and I have to go ask the police officer because my best friend is scared of this person who is supposed to be put in place to protect her. That I have to go and ask for directions because the police do not see my skin color as a threat, but they see hers as a threat. Yeah, that's the point. Yay. And the police should not be a pride. End of story. Yeah. Like, the, yeah. the root. Why are we? So starting leaving the village and going past Stonewall. It should be ending there. Yeah. So why are we marching to Midtown? And as it's been previously mentioned, we have many disabled members of our community. They can't necessarily go all those three miles back no. to, um, to Stonewall and to the village. And it's ridiculous. We should be marching from Midtown to, to Stonewall. And just it, it makes no sense as a route what does Midtown have to do with being LGBTQ? Money. Yeah. Money. <laughs> right? Money, right? We are everything. We are everything. <laughs> who I can bring a microphone to. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, my name is Andy Velez. I'm a founding member of ACT UP. And I want, I want to speak to the hop people who are here tonight. I don't see you as enemies. I see you as having a kernel of queerness in you that hasn't been polished as much as it should be. It needs to pop. It needs to, it need, it needs to pop. So uh, don't be afraid of us. We are you and you are us. And we need to be all together because we have enough enemies outside these rooms without making more. So please, be courageous. Be willing to talk with us. You may find we have more in common than you think. Well said, Andy. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Next. Um, I have to, I'm also very tall, so I'm going to pull it up. Um, so one, one thing, I was actually pretty neutral when I gave this opening remarks. So one thing that I would want to add is when we went to the meeting and we were told there wouldn't be a resistance contingent and the only one would be the people of color contingent, what we were actually told was that uh, they felt it would dilute our message to have the resistance contingent together, and so... What message? Were the, a political resistance. Well, what's their um, message? And so we would be asked to spread out. 
uh, which just, there's a couple things going on in that that you may want to ruminate on for a second. But um, what I want to say too is that I, the truth is I appreciate a lot of what Hop does. I, I, it's really hard to plan an event of this size and they do it all year and I don't want to take on all that responsibility. And, uh, and I also do appreciate, I think they recognize these issues to some extent because they are limiting the number of people that can walk with corporations who typically have the most. And I want to give them the credit where it's due, but as with all of you, I really do feel like it's not enough, and I feel like consistently we're not being heard. I don't want to have another pride. I don't want to have a resistance pride. This is our pride. This is it, right? There's no reason we shouldn't have like, oh, this is the corporate pride, and this is the everybody else pride. It doesn't make any sense. My attitude... Ow. Okay, well, my attitude is nothing is set in stone until it actually happens. We, we may have seven weeks, but we can do whatever we can in that seven weeks to make it as close to what we want this pride to be as possible. And then there is nothing that we cannot accomplish within a year if we have people who are willing to listen to and support us. So that's where I'm at. Thank you, Jay. Hi, I'm Huckle Ferry, and I just want to say that in 1994, um, during the 25th anniversary of Stonewall, a press release was put out, not by Hot, but by um, another organization, asking that drag queens and leather people and other marginalized people within the community not show up. Oh, yeah. And that year, we started, that year we started the Drag March, and this is the 24th year that we've been doing the Drag March, and I just want to say that there are alternatives. I, don't, I say don't give up on HOP, but we can make other places for us to feel free, welcome, and solidarity. Hi, I'm Naomi Brussel. I work with a radio show on WBAI called Out FM. It's a queer radio show. You're welcome to listen to us, except we're doing fun drive this, this month. But when we're back, we'll be on Tuesday night from 9 to 10. I, I was wondering, I know there was this mention of the question of the people of color contingent. And I'm wondering whether and how we claim pride is connecting with that group or not? I'm just wondering if, if you could give us some information about it. Anyone? Uh, yes, Jake. Um, yeah, we, um, we, you know, as Jake said, we were told early on that the, um, that the Audre Lorde Project is uh, apparently <laughs> coordinating that people of color contingent that is supposed to be toward the front of, of the Pride March, um, which, by the way, if they're saying that the resistance contingent all being together would dilute the presence of the resistance in the Pride March, but somehow putting all the people of color together at the beginning of the Pride March and then making the rest of the Pride March really, really white. So we've reached out to the Audre Lord Project. They have an interim ED who we we're trying to connect with. Um, Leslie has, um, has has spoken a little bit. We're going to continue following up with them. And uh, we haven't been able to get the full list of who the People of Color contingent is. We've asked for that, but that's kind of being kept in the mist somewhat. Um, but we're going to keep trying to ferret out whatever information that we can. And we're going to try to reach out to as many groups that represent organizations that serve um, different communities of color within our communities um, uh, as much as we can. So it's not a full answer, but it's as much as we got, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, Apollo. <laughs> Apollo, yeah. Um, yeah, I've been listening to everything and the issues I'm having, listening to all the conversations, everyone's asking for permission from Hart. Uh, basically, they, they do do a lot of work to organize this, and it is a large project to do, but they do not have a parade, a march, without the community. The community is not happy with what they're doing. My feeling about this is that you dictate where the march is going. Yeah. If you don't think the, the route that they have planned 
is correct. When that march starts, you go to the point, if there's a barricade in front of you, you stand there, if you have to, until those barricades are moved. You have to dictate where this is going. And if, I mean, I understand everyone's trying to negotiate with them, which I understand because there is a long history there. But you need to set a precedence that the community is about resistance and everything that you've been talking about. And if this year there is not a real concise effort to reach some type of realistic compromise with all the groups within the community, that next year, you know, it's basically, it's gonna be a true resistance which means there's gonna be no permits, no nothing, it's just gonna be about taking the streets the way it should be. Uh, because the reality is if everyone going to Pride actually just took the streets and went in one direction without even going in between any of the barricades, they could create their own march going directly down. I mean, it's like San Francisco used to be. Um, but, um, you know, that, that's the thing I'm doing. The only other issue is I know everyone's talking about politicians and reaching out. Just be careful about that. Um, even though there are some individuals that have good intentions, a lot of them are in bed with the corporations and creating a situation that you have right now. Um, that's, uh, and Cynthia Nixon definitely reach out to her. I think she would be interested in doing it and she wouldn't be doing it basically to be up front with her own political team. Uh, but just the, fact, just the idea of having her in there might give you a little cover. I would also like to point out that no one knows what the route is this year, so it would be easy to hijack the parade and take it wherever we want to take it. And it's not planning something, but if it was me, I'd basically, whatever it is, I know the direction we want to do. I would reach out to all the groups that have been excluded over the last few years, talk to them about the fact that there needs to be a real resistance, a real rebirth of what this is about. And that when this march actually starts, we are going to go to this point, and we know where our destination is. And if there are any barricades, we will stand there. And if we have to remove them, we will remove them. Will people most likely get arrested? Yes, but are they going to arrest a thousand people? No. I mean, if a thousand people get yes. barricade, well, if that thousand people are getting arrested, then split them in two groups, then go around that group and just keep going. There are more than a thousand. They have to give in at some point, but you have to make a strong statement. And if you do that, you'll definitely be covered by the press, the media, and it would be a big stink that this city, I don't think, really wants to deal with, especially with it being an election year. Thank you. Yeah. So. Okay, well, so we have nine minutes left total, and then that's it, so let's go ahead. And I'll be quick. Uh, my name is Brandon, I go by he, him. Um, I wanna appreciate, I wanna thank everybody for coming out today. Um, you know, I'm from ACT UP, and a lot of this discussion started last year. Uh, many, as many of you know, on December 1st, uh, World AIDS Day, the Gay Officers Action League goal from NYPD uh, was invited basically to kind of take over out of the darkness the World AIDS Day, the annual World AIDS Day vigil. Um, they were invited to sing the national anthem, have dozens of police around the New York AIDS Memorial. Uh, lead the lead the march down to Christopher Street, past the Stone Wall, with a color guard and uh, some form of a band, um, which was yeah, which was completely shameful, backpipes and everything else. Um, and then at the end of the at the end of the vigil, uh, they had dozens of police in a church space with cars, you know, multiple police cars outside, multiple officers outside. When you walked up, I assumed I was gonna be checked, like, you know, checked my bag and everything else physically. It was a very unwelcoming space uh, for people of color who we need to end the AIDS epidemic. Um, so I thank all of you for coming out, um, you know, starting back in December and everything and talking about this. I just wanna let people know that if you, whatever you feel about the police, and whatever you feel about what happened on World AIDS Day, if you're interested in dialogue or protest or bird dogging, 
Uh, goal is having events all this week in every borough, doing publicity outreach. The next event is on Monday in Brooklyn uh, at 6.30 uh, at the Brooklyn Pride Center. It's from 6.30 to 8.30. It's like a coffee chat or something with uh, your LGBT officers at Goal. ACT UP's gonna be there. They've got another event next Thursday here at the LGBT Center. Uh, Goal will be meeting with members of the community from 6.30 to 8.30. Uh, we'll be there, thank you. Jeremiah E. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the energy has just been fantastic in this room tonight, and it feels so good to be excited about Pride. You know, like this is this is the energy. You know, and um, in terms of you know the next steps, a lot of the things that we really want to do, whether it's to show up with a resistance contingent, whether people like it or not, whether it's to create an alternative Pride or hijack a Pride or whatever we want to do, um, it's a numbers game. That's about mobilization, and so some of the most important things that we can do, we need to be signing on to the demands as individuals and as organizations. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about stuff that's here on the bottom of this flyer that was handed out to you tonight. Definitely come to the next planning meeting a week from Saturday. Um, we have such great energy, I almost wish that we, we weren't, you know, didn't wait a week, we thought we might need a week, but, um, you know, definitely come to that. Invite people to this. We're going to get an event up on Facebook for that, so make sure that people are coming to it. We want to get media, we want to get stories out there, um, and definitely make sure that you're signed up with your your email on uh, on the list so that we can keep in contact with everybody. Um, yeah, and just really excited to work with everybody here. Is there a website where people can sign on and we can tell people to sign on? Uh, we, have a, we, have a, we have a Facebook, Facebook page, page, we have a Twitter account, it's, we have Instagram. And that takes endorsements from groups um, and the bottom of the flyer. On the, the bottom of the flyer, there's, there's a way that you can uh, sign up. Yes. And uh, uh, everyone, could everyone join me in thanking our, our, our moderators? Oh. Yes, thank you to the organizers of this, and yeah. let's keep it up and keep it going. So just one more thing. So it's next Saturday at 1.30? Yeah. Yes. 1.30. I just want to make sure that's super clear. Saturday the 12th. Saturday the 12th at 1.30. Okay, thank you, thank you all. We ended early. That's a record Appreciate event it. right there. <laughs>